And we can start the conference. So welcome back, everyone. A few um, items of housekeeping before we, uh, before we start. Uh, at lunchtime today, uh, we've, with the help of two enterprising graduate students who know where they're going, Corey, would you raise your hand or actually stand up? And Danny, where are you? Now oh, there you are, Danny. See Danny? Okay, with the help of Corey and Danny, those of you who might have, who, who might have an interest in visiting the cliffs, taking a nice walk uh, after lunch, um, Danny and Corey will escort you. Uh, but I think the best thing to do is to, because the, there's, the best thing to do is for you to eat first. So take, you know, 20 minutes or something like that to eat lunch. And then if you want to go for a walk after lunch, um, just meet right outside those doors and Danny and Corey will, will take you over to the cliffs. Okay, so for those of you who are interested. Um, I would like to remind you that there is a dinner at our house, Dana and my house, this evening, starting at 6 o'clock or whenever it is you get there after the conference. Uh, those of you who uh, have a car, just you know, come on and drive over. I think you have the address. If you don't have the address, please ask me. Um, the rest of you who need, a, those of you who need a ride, will get a ride just from one of us or from a, a graduate student who's offered to take, take you or perhaps a faculty member. Uh, so let's just congregate here at the end. Well, where else are we going to congregate? And then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll distribute. We haven't done this ahead of time, but we'll figure out a way of getting everybody there. Okay, sounds good. Are there any questions? All right, so um, to start us off, I have a, a, a limerick for you. I don't know if you know this, but I'm, uh, apparently I, I write limericks. So uh, this is in honor of uh, a former mentor of ours, Warren Quinn at UCLA. You should not always aim at the best. If you harm, then you've wrongly aggressed. Direct agency's bad. If it tempts, you're a cad. Show respect. I'll be greatly impressed. Okay, so without further ado. <laughs> Uh, the first session was supposed to have been uh, chaired by Blythe Green. She's not available right now, so Danny Weltman is going to do the honors. Hi, good morning, everybody. Our first session is uh, the speaker is Michael Zimmerman from University of North Carolina, uh, Greensboro, and the respondent will be our own uh, Dana Nelkin. And please join me in welcoming Michael. Thank you very much. Am I being heard? Is that okay? Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I'm, it's a great occasion, and I'm very grateful for all those who have arranged it or otherwise contributed. There's a handout which I hope each of you has. Omissions pose a number of philosophical questions. In this paper, I will focus on two questions in particular. How are omissions related to action? Are omissions within our control? Section one, control. It's not only agents that can control what happens. As Robert Nozick observes, a thermostat controls the temperature in a room. This is a simple example of non-agential control. An airplane's autopilot system provides a more sophisticated example. It's tempting to construe such control in terms of subjunctive conditionals. If the temperature were to transcend certain limits, the thermostat would restore it to a preset range. If the plane were to stray off course or suddenly lose altitude or airspeed, the autopilot would fix the problem. And so on. Such conditionals ascribe certain capacities to the thermostat and to the autopilot. Of course, there are some familiar difficulties here. The conditionals that I've just given hardly suffice. They would need to be qualified considerably to capture the specific features of the control at issue. And even then, there's the question whether they might misfire due to some mask or fink. 
Thermostats and autopilots are mere machines, not people. But people sometimes exhibit control of the same kind as machines like these. For example, by sweating or shivering, one controls one's body temperature. But people also often exhibit a kind of control that it seems mere machines cannot. A simple mundane example is that of my raising my hand at will. A more sophisticated example is that of a regular pilot flying an airplane at will. The phrase at will is telling. It invokes an attribute, volition, or to use an archaic term, the faculty of will, one that agents possess but that non-agents do not, and it suggests that the conditionals associated with agential control in particular should be couched in terms related to this feature. If I were to will, or try, or choose, or decide to raise my hand, I would do so. If the pilot were to will, or try, or choose, or decide to fly the plane, he or she would do so. A distinctive feature of such conditionals is that the antecedent makes reference to some mental attitude with intentional content, while the consequent makes reference to behavior that matches that content. I will call such statements attitude behavior conditionals, or AB conditionals for short. In the examples just given, the behavior that is mentioned is physical. In other cases, involving control over one's deliberations, for example, it may be mental. The idea that agential control is to be understood in terms of A-B conditionals of, is, of course, hardly new. It can be traced at least as far back as Hobbes. And it is surely an attractive one. I want now to raise a number of points in pursuit of this idea. Point one. Agents are individual objects of a certain sort, but what sort of thing is it that agents control? The answer is not immediately obvious. Consider the examples just given of my raising my hand and the pilots flying the plane at will. On the surface, these seem to be cases of one individual object, an agent, controlling another, a hand, a plane. But in each case, closer inspection would seem to reveal that what is controlled is, more precisely, the movement of the object in question. So that what should be said to be in the agent's control is, strictly, not the object itself, but some event that involves the object. Yet I don't think that that can be quite right either. The problem is that control has a dual aspect. If I am in control of my raising my hand, then how, or indeed whether I raise it, is up to me. The how is, I think, reducible to the whether. Suppose that I can raise my hand in ten different ways. Then my being in control of how I raise my hand is tantamount to its being the case that, for each of these ten different ways in which I might raise it, I'm in control of whether I raise it in that way. Still, the question remains what precisely the object of my control is and into what ontological category it is to be placed. The answer to which I am inclined is this. There are a number of states of affairs involved in the example. My raising my hand in way one, my raising my hand in way two, and so on. Such states of affairs are abstract objects that exist necessarily but obtain, if they obtain at all, only contingently. To say that I'm in control of whether I raise my hand in way one or way two and so on is to say, somewhat more precisely, that each of the states of affairs in question is such that I can see to it that it obtains, and I can also see to it that it does not obtain. I don't pretend that this is fully perspicuous. The phrase, see to it that, in this respect, a term of art that deserves scrutiny. English furnishes a number of locutions that give expression to the fact that whether some state of affairs X obtains is in the control of some agent A. There may be some subtle differences in meaning among these locutions, but for present purposes I will regard them as synonymous. A, the well, first locution, A is in control of whether X obtains. Second, A is in control of X. Third, A has, con has control over X. 4. X is under A's control. 5. X is in A's control. If control of the sort at issue has a dual aspect, and if it is to be understood in terms of A, B conditionals, if, then a pair of such conditionals will be involved. We might say, for example, that if I have agential control over my raising my hand in way one, then not only is it the case that if I were to decide to raise it in this way, I would raise it in this way, but it is also the case that if I were to, to decide otherwise, I wouldn't raise it in this way. Conditionals of this sort ascribe an ability to some agent. 
just as conditionals of the sort mentioned earlier ascribe a capacity to some machine. Agential control consists in having both the ability to see to it that some state of affairs obtains and the ability to see to it that it does not obtain. As is well recognized though, in this context, we should distinguish between what may be called general and specific abilities. And it is not just general, but also specific abilities that are required for agential control. If one has the specific ability to do something, then one has the general ability to do it, but the converse does not hold, since one must also have the opportunity to exercise that general ability. For example, Usain Bolt has the amazing ability to run 100 meters in under 10 seconds, as do a few other people. This is just a general ability, though, since not even Bolt has the specific ability to run that fast if he is asleep or debilitated by illness or bound to a chair. And if he lacks the specific ability to do so here and now, then he is certainly not here and now in control of whether he does so. Point two. Just now I characterized my control over my raising my hand in terms of a pair of conditionals having to do with my deciding whether to raise it. I should explain why I appealed to deciding in particular in order to give expression to the volitional nature of agential control. I, inter I, I intend the term decide to be understood in one way liberally, but in another way conservatively. Some philosophers, Randy is an example, use it restrictively, applying it only to cases in which some practical uncertainty needs settling. I'm using it more liberally. For example, when the time comes to choose dessert, one can decide to order the cheesecake, even if one never seriously entertained any alternative. Nonetheless, what I have in mind in the present context is the kind of decision that may be called an, ex an executive decision, a decision to do something here and now, as opposed to the kind of decision to do something later that may fail to culminate in action due to the decisions having been forgotten or revoked. I take executive decisions to be the locus of an agent's exercise of control. Consider a well-known example of Donald Davidson's, quote, I flip the switch, turn on the light, and illuminate the room, end quote. As I construe this example, it is an executive decision of mine that sets a certain train of events in motion. We can picture the situation as in figure one on your handout. The arrows represent causation. Uh, big A, I, I just realized uh, when I wrote this uh, paper, I foolishly didn't uh, give thought to how I could make the distinction between upper and lower cases audible. So I'm going to have to read this in a somewhat silly way. Um, big A, which consists simply of little a, is the minimal action, if it can be called an action at all, constituted by my decision to act. Big B, which consists of my decision, little a, causing the rising of my hand, little b, is the action of my raising my hand. In von Wright's terminology, little b is the result of big B. Big C, which consists of little a's causing the change in position of the switch, little c, is the action of my flipping the switch. Big D, which consists of a's, little a's causing the lights going on, little d, is the action of my turning on the light. Big E, which consists of little a's causing the room's illumination, little e, is the, act, is the action of my illuminating the room. Note that in light of the causal connections between little a and little b through little e, I may be said to do big E by doing big D, big D by doing big C, and so on. In terminology that's familiar, but nonetheless sometimes used differently by different philosophers, Big A, or possibly Big B, is a basic action, while the others are non-basic actions. Figure one provides a graphic representation of this Russian doll-like nesting of basic actions within non-basic actions within non-basic actions. Davidson's example illustrates the fact that control may be merely indirect. Whether the room is illuminated is up to me, but only because I am in control of the lights going on. Moreover, I am in control of the lights going on only because I am in control of the position of the switch. And of course, I am in control of the position of the switch only because, ultimately, I am in control of my decision to act. It is little a that is in my direct control. The other results of my actions, little b through little e, are in my control, but only indirectly so. What are the actions, big B through big E themselves? 
Since they are composed of a combination of little a, which is in my direct control, and some causal consequences of little a, excuse me, some causal consequence of little a, which is only in my indirect control, I think we should declare my control over them hybrid. It's noteworthy that each of the results, little b through little e, over which I have indirect control, and each of the actions, big B through big E, over which I have hybrid control, might feature in AB conditionals of the sort I have used. If I were to decide that the event in question should occur, it would, but if I were to decide otherwise, it wouldn't. But it's also noteworthy that in the case under discussion, that event, little a, over which I have direct control, will not feature in such a conditional. In particular, it is not the case that my control over little a is to be understood in terms of the claim that if I were to, to decide that little a should occur, it would. Since all control is anchored in direct control, <coughs> it, <coughs> excuse me, it follows that agential control cannot be understood wholly in terms of A-B conditionals of the sort at issue. This is an important point to which I will return. It's also important to note that the phrase decide otherwise is ambiguous. I'll return to this point also. Nonetheless, it may be that the truth of some such conditional is necessary for the possession of either indirect or hybrid control. Is it? Point three. Davidson continues his example in this way. Quote, unbeknownst to me, I also alert a prowler to the fact that I am home. End quote. This extension of the case may be pictured as follows, where little f is the event of the prowler's becoming aware of the fact that I am home, and big F is the action of my making him aware of this fact. <coughs> now, despite the fact that I am in control of whether the prowler becomes aware of my presence, I am nonetheless unaware of his presence, and so the fact that his being alerted is up to me is also something of which I am unaware. This being the case, my control over his being alerted is clearly not to be understood, even partly in terms of a pair of A-B conditionals having to do with a decision of mine regarding his being alerted. My control over big F and little f is therefore importantly different from my control over big A through big E and little a through little e. <coughs> when I raise my hand, flip the switch, turn on the light and illuminate the room, I do so intentionally. In performing these actions, I exercise not just the specific ability to perform them, but the specific ability to perform them intentionally. It's partly, partly in virtue of this fact that it is appropriate to say regarding each of big, three, big B through Big E that if I were to decide to do it, I would. When I alert the prowler, however, I do so unintentionally. It's for this reason that the specific ability that I have and exercise with respect to Big F is different. I can and do do it, but not intentionally. It's partly in virtue of this fact that we cannot understand my control over big F, even partly in terms of the statement that if I were to decide to do F, I would. Following Al Mealy, let us call the ability I have with respect to big F a simple, as opposed to an intentional ability, where having an ability to do something intentionally entails having a simple ability to do that thing, but not vice versa. Although having a simple ability to do something X cannot be understood even partly in terms of an A-B conditional having to do with the decision regarding X, there's nonetheless good reason to think that this does not mean that the truth of some closely related A-B conditional isn't necessary for all indirect or hybrid control, whether intentional or simple. Even though not all action is intentional action, since all action is rooted in executive decisions which are themselves intentional, all action requires intentional action. For this reason, although simple control over X does not require intentional control over X, it does require intentional control over something related to X. For example, my simple control over my alerting the prowler is contingent on my intentional control over the other antecedent events in the example. And so, if the truth of A-B conditionals is necessary for intentional, indirect, or hybrid control, then it's also necessary for simple, indirect, or hybrid control. For example, even if my control over my alerting the prowler is not to be understood even partly in terms of its being the case that if I were to decide to alert him, I would, 
It may nonetheless be that, that my control over alerting him is to be understood partly in terms of its being the case that if I were to decide to raise my hand, I would. <clears throat> Point four. But even if Davidson's example regarding the prowler does not provide a reason to deny that the truth of AB conditionals is necessary for indirect or hybrid control, there might nonetheless be a good reason to deny this. This appears to be the lesson that J.L. Austin intends us to draw from the following famous example, quote, consider the case where I miss a very short putt and kick myself because I could have hold it. It's not that I should, by which he means would, have hold it if I had tried. I did try and missed. It's not that I should have hold it if conditions had been different. That might of course be so, but I'm talking about conditions as they precisely were and asserting that I could have hold it, end quote. Austin claims that he could have hold the putt, and that seems plausible. Moreover, had he hold it, he would presumably have done so intentionally. Thus, it seems that the kind of control Austin had over holding the putt was, was intentional control. What then explains his missing it? Austin suggests that there might be no good explanation in the offing. He says, quote, if I tried my hardest, say, and missed, surely there must have been something that caused me to fail that may be unable to succeed so that I could not have hold it. Well, a modern belief in science in there being an explanation of everything may make us assent to this argument, but such a belief is not in line with the traditional beliefs enshrined in the word can. According to them, a human ability or power or capacity is inherently liable not to produce success on occasion, and that for no reason, or are bad luck and bad form sometimes reasons, end quote. Again, this line of reasoning seems plausible. Randy Clark suggests that the Austin's example might be a case in which Austin's ability to hold the putt is masked by, say, a lapse of attention, and that that is why the A-B conditional at issue namely, if I were to try to hold the putt, I would hold it, is false, despite the fact that Austin had the pertinent ability. In this context, a mask is to be understood as something that blocks the exercise of an ability without removing that ability. Even if uh, that's right, though, the possibility remains that the truth of some other AB conditional is necessary for Austin's having intentional control over his holding the putt. One suggestion is that we should weaken the, con the conditional so that instead of, if I were to try to hold the putt, I would hold it, we have instead something like, if I were to try to hold the putt, I might hold it, or if I were to try to hold the putt, I would probably hold it. Hold it. <clears throat> but although it's surely very plausible to say that the truth of these weaker claims is indeed necessary for Austin's having the specific ability to hold the putt intentionally, I think we can say more than this. <clears throat> An, in, an alternative suggestion is to look not for a weaker version of the same AB conditional, but for a, a different AB conditional. Suppose that Austin did in fact try his hardest to hold the putt, but still missed it. Then clearly, <coughs> if I were to try to my hardest to hold the putt, I would hold it, is not the conditional we're looking for. Still, if Austin could indeed have hold the putt, it seems to me likely that there was and must have been some other way in which he could have tried to hold it such that if he had tried in that way to hold it, he would have succeeded in holding it and holding it intentionally. <clears throat> I'm inclined to think, therefore, that Austin's example does not give us a good reason to deny that the truth of an A-B conditional of the sort I have in mind, if I were to decide to stand just so and to move my putter just so, etc., I would hold the putt, is necessary for his having had control over holding the putt. Still, I acknowledge that this claim is controversial since it's arguable that, as Randy puts it somewhere, there might be no end to what can mask an ability. <clears throat> I should also acknowledge that whatever the merits of the claim that I've just made, it does not address the question whether the, possi whether the possibility of finks, entities that subvert an agent's ability in just the kind of circumstances in which that ability would typically be exercised, might provide a good reason to deny the truth of uh, that the truth of A-B conditionals of the sort in question is necessary for indirect or hybrid control. What if Austin's golfing partner had been poised to yell four if Austin had drawn back his putter in just the way necessary for him to hold the putt? A, sh a shout that would have so distracted Austin that he would have ended up missing the putt. Wouldn't Austin still have retained the ability to hold the putt? 
Here I think the answer is, well, I say here, straightforward. I think that was <clears throat> a mistake on my part. Anyway, yes, Austin would have, missed, uh, would have retained the general ability to hold the putt, but no, he would have lost the specific ability uh, required for his having been in control over whether he hold the putt. <clears throat> Under the circumstances, it was, it was not up to him whether he hold it, given that he was not in control over whether his partner was prepared to yell for. Thus, I remain inclined to think that the truth of A-B conditionals of the sort I've been considering is indeed necessary for the possession of indirect and uh, or hybrid agential control. Point five. Even if the truth of A-B conditionals of the sort I've been considering is necessary for the possession of indirect or hybrid control, though it's clearly not necessary for the possession of direct control. As I observed earlier, my direct control over my deciding to act cannot itself be understood in terms of A-B conditionals having to do with my deciding to decide. The reason is plain. Such a condition on direct control would be impossible to satisfy, for it would generate a regress of deciding, one that would require that the agent be capable of making a decision the intentional content of which was infinite, and no agent is ever capable of doing that. Yet, I assume, some agents are sometimes capable of exercising agential control, direct control. The problem here is perfectly general. I may be mistaken in holding that it is executive decisions that are the locus of an agent's exercise of control. Perhaps the locus lies in some other form of volition. To remain neutral on this matter, let us simply talk of being in general, uh, rather than of deciding in particular. The fact is that whatever being is, the possession of direct control cannot be understood in terms of a condition or of the form, if one were to V to V, then one would V. It may be retorted that this just shows that it is a mistake to think that agential control requires control over one's volitions. But it seems clear that it does require such control. It may be the case both that if I were to decide to raise my hand, I would raise it, and that if I were to decide otherwise, I wouldn't raise it. Still, I may have no control over my raising my hand, and I won't if, for example, I'm in a coma. In such a case, I lack hybrid control over my raising my hand precisely because I lacked direct control over my deciding to raise it. And this point would remain true no matter what form of volition was substituted for deciding. But even if direct control cannot require the truth of, and thus cannot be understood in terms of, A, B conditionals of the sort I've been considering, it remains possible that it is to be understood in terms of A, B conditionals of some other sort. Perhaps, for example, my control over my deciding to raise my hand is to be understood as consisting in the truth of the following pair of claims. If I were to desire to raise my hand more strongly than I desired not to raise it, I would decide to raise it. And if I were to desire, otherwise I wouldn't. Or it might be that my control over my deciding to raise my hand is to be understood as consisting in the truth of a pair of non-AB conditionals, such as if I were to have a reason to raise my hand stronger than any reason I had not to raise it, I would decide to raise it, whereas if I didn't, I wouldn't. It might be objected to such proposals in turn that if I am not in control over, over whether I have a desire to raise my hand or whether I have a reason to raise it, then I cannot, after all, be in control of my deciding to raise it. Here, though, the objection seems to me more dubious. I take it as a datum that if I'm in a coma and therefore cannot decide to raise my hand, then I cannot raise it, where raise refers to a form of genuine agency. Perhaps being in a coma does not preclude one's raising one's hand as a result, for example, of electrical stimulation of some portion of the brain. I don't take it as a datum that if I'm in a deep depression and therefore cannot summon a desire to raise my hand, or if I cannot manufacture a reason to raise my hand, then I cannot decide to raise it. This isn't to say that I have no sympathy with the objection. On the contrary, I do, but it's not clear to me just how it might be supported. Anyone in favor of the objection had better not rely on the general principle that in order for A to be in control of X, A must be in control of everything upon which X is obtaining is contingent, for although this principle certainly entails that if I'm not in control of my desiring to raise my hand or having a reason to raise it, and if my deciding to raise it is contingent on my having such a desire or a reason, then I am not in control of my deciding to raise it. 
The fact is that the principle is unacceptable, for it places a condition on control that no one could satisfy, and yet, I'm assuming, it is sometimes possible for agents to possess and exercise control. And I'm not sure if any weaker, more plausible principle would do the job. It might be said that there's nonetheless good reason to reject the claim that I am in control of my deciding to raise my hand only if it's true that if I had a stronger desire or reason to raise it than I had not to raise it, I would decide to raise it. And that is that no such would conditional is consistent with my freely willing to raise my hand. At best, only a might or a would probably conditional would, could be true. In response, I will only say this. First, the incompatibilist view of freedom of will that inspires this remark is highly controversial. Indeed, it's controversial whether incompatibilism requires assenting to the remark in the first place. Secondly, and more importantly, in assuming that agents are sometimes capable of possessing and exercising control, I am not assuming that agents are ever capable of free will and action in whatever sense or senses of these terms might be taken to be at issue in the per perennial debate over free will. Nor am I assuming that they are not. It is, I think, obvious that we are agents in the sense that we are capable of performing actions and sometimes actually do so, but I don't think it's at all obvious that we are free agents. I also take it to be clear, though perhaps less obvious, that volition is the hallmark of agency, but I don't think it's at all obvious that we ever enjoy freedom of will. And I take it to be clear that we sometimes possess and exercise control over our behavior. Look, here's proof. Uh, here's one hand and here is another, and I'm controlling how they move. But I don't think it's at all obvious that uh, such control is tantamount to freedom. Point six. I should say something finally about the distinction which I have invoked on several occasions uh, between the possession and the exercise of control. I noted earlier that one may have a general ability to do something and yet fail to do it because one lacks the opportunity to exercise that ability. If so, one lacks the specific ability to do that thing. Of course, one may have a specific ability to do something and still fail to do it because, for example, one chooses not to do it. If so, one will have failed to exercise one's specific ability. To exercise an ability to do something, whether that ability is general or specific, is simply to do that which one has the ability to do. If I have the ability to raise my hand intentionally, then my raising it intentionally constitutes the exercise of that intentional ability. If I have the ability to alert the prowler, then my alerting him constitutes the exercise of that simple ability. Sometimes we talk of being able to exercise an ability to do something. If the ability in, in question is general, then I think that what's meant by saying that one is able to exercise that ability is that one has the opportunity and thus the specific ability to do the thing in question. For example, to say that under the present circumstances Usain Bolt has the ability to exercise his general ability to run 100 meters in under 10 seconds is to say that nothing in the circumstances prevents him from exercising that ability. If the ability in question is specific, however, then as far as I can tell, talk of being able to exercise it is redundant. For example, to say that under the present circumstances Bolt has the ability to exercise his specific ability to run 100 meters in under 10 seconds is to say no more than that he has that specific ability. As noted earlier, control consists in having both a specific ability to see to it that some state of affairs obtains and a specific ability to see to it that state of affairs does not obtain. Since specific abilities are the sort of thing that can be exercised, control is the sort of thing that can be exercised. Thus, if I am in control of whether I decide to raise my hand and I do decide to raise it, I will have exercised direct intentional control over my decision. If I am in control of whether I raise my hand and I do raise it, I will have exercised hybrid intentional control over my raising it and indirect intentional control over its rising. And if I am in control over whether I alert the prowler and I do so, I will have exercised hybrid simple control over my alerting him and indirect simple control over his becoming aware of my presence. I'm going to drop a paragraph about the timing of the exercise of control. Uh, sometimes we talk of it being up to us whether to exercise the control we have. Since control involves specific abilities, such talk is, I think, redundant. Suppose that it's up to me whether I raise my hand. 
then to say that it is also up to me whether to exercise my control seems infelicitous insofar as it suggests erroneously that something more is being said than just that it is up to me whether I raise my hand. I've said that if I'm in, in control of whether I raise my hand and I do raise it, then I will have exercised my control over my raising it. What if I don't raise it, though? Will I still have exercised my control over my raising it? The answer may depend on how I manage not to raise my hand. To investigate this question, I must now at last say something about controlling omissions. So section two, controlling omissions. One omits to perform some act only if one does not perform it. Thus, all omission requires not doing. Nonetheless, omission does not require inaction. Return to Davidson's case. I flip the switch, turn on the light, and illuminate the room. Unbeknownst to me, I also alert a prowler to the fact that I'm home. Earlier, I pictured this case as in figure two, which I guess is some, on some other page than what you're looking at now. Um, I also assumed that I was in control, whether direct, indirect, or hybrid, whether simple or intentional, of all the events represented in figure two. But this figure doesn't fully capture that fact since it fails to reflect, reflect the dual aspect of control. The figure only represents the fact that I brought all these events about. It fails to represent the fact that I could have behaved otherwise, that I could have omitted doing what I did. To complete the picture, a companion figure is needed. What should this figure look like? Well, point one, one possibility is figure three on your handout. This figure is supposed to be interpreted as follows. Big A star, which consists simply of little A star, is my decision not to raise my hand. Big B star, which consists of my decision little A star, causing my hands not rising, not little b, is my omitting to raise my hand. Big C star, which consists of my decision little a star, causing the switches not changing position, not little c, is, a, is my omitting to flip the switch, and so on down the line. Note that in light of the causal connections between little a star through not little f, I may be said to accomplish big F star, that is, to omit big F, by accomplishing big E star, to accomplish big E star by accomplishing big D star, and so on. Figure three and my description of it raise a number of important questions. First, what sort of entities are not little b through not little f supposed to be? Second, are these the kind of entity that can in fact be related by causation? Third, when do these entities occur? Here I can only gesture at answers to these questions. First, I'm inclined to think that not little b through not little f are genuine events. Consider not little b. I've described that this as the event of my hands not rising. I'm not thinking of this simply as a kind of negative fact, consisting in its being the case that my hand does not rise, for such a fact can obtain without my hand ever having existed at all. I'm thinking of it rather as a kind of negative event, one that involves my hand and consists in something happening to or with my hand. It is something like the event of my hands remaining unrisen. Second, if not little b through not little f are genuine events, then they are genuine candidates for being related by causation. Still, it might be that the kind of causation at issue differs somewhat from that which binds positive events. Initially, it might seem correct to describe the relation between little a star and not little b as I just did, namely, as my decision not to raise my hand causing my hands not rising. That is, as my decisions causing my hand to remain unrisen. But in fact, I'm not sure that that's quite right. After all, my hand was, by hypothesis, already unrisen, and it had been remaining so for some time. Perhaps then my decision not to raise it caused it to remain remaining unrisen. But that, of course, raises difficulties of its own. Or perhaps the pertinent relation between little a star and not little b consists in little a stars causing some positive event, x, whose occurrence was causally incompatible with the occurrence of of little b, or perhaps some other account is preferable. Finally, as to the question of time of occurrence, although my hand was already unrisen and had been remaining so for some time before I made 
uh, my decision not to raise it, if little a star, my decision not to raise my hand, caused not little b, my hand remaining or remaining, remaining unrisen, then I assume not little b cannot have occurred before little a star. When did not little b cease to occur? That's unclear to me. In the present case, though, I think we can say, say at least this, not little b occurred throughout the period that little b would have occurred had I decided to raise my hand. Now, I readily concede that the foregoing brief discussion of the three questions I have mentioned barely scratches the surface of the deep and complex issues that they concern. But this is not the place to, for me to try to explore them further. Nonetheless, we can surely grant that figure three represents a kind of situation with which we are all familiar. And so whatever difficulties we may encounter in answering the question should not incline us to doubt that such a situation can arise. I noted earlier that events such as little b through little f over which I have indirect control and actions such as big, three, big, excuse me, big b through big f over which I have hybrid control might feature in a, b conditionals of the following sort. If I were to decide that the event in question should occur, it would, and if I were to decide otherwise, it wouldn't. I also noted that the phrase decide otherwise is ambiguous. One interpretation of that phrase is provided by the case depicted in figure three. In that figure, it is a star, big or little, that constitutes my deciding otherwise. And the other events represented in the figure are what would happen if I were so to decide. Given that a star is in my direct control, then those other events are also in my indirect or hybrid control. And if I exercise my control over a star by making the decision not to raise my hand, I will thereby exercise my control over those other events. Now, a, big A star is, of course, not an, an omission, but big B star through big F star are. More particularly, B star through E star are intentional omissions, and F star is an unintentional omission. In this way, omissions, just like regular actions, can constitute the exercise of control. Point two. Another interpretation of the phrase decide otherwise is provided by the case depicted in figure four. The difference between figures three and four consists, of course, in the difference between big A star through big F star on the one hand and not big A through not big F on the other. And that difference is to be traced to the difference between little a star and not little a. That is, to the difference between my deciding not to raise my hand and my not deciding to raise my hand. In figure four, it is the latter that constitutes my deciding otherwise. In the case depicted in figure four, there is no activity on my part at all. Prior to the occurrence of not little a, I had not decided to raise my hand, and not little a is simply the event of my continuing not to decide to raise my hand. This way of describing not little a is preferable to describing it as the event of my remaining undecided, I think. The latter description suggests that I had been deliberating whether to raise my hand. That may have been the case, but it need not have been. Many omissions occur, as we know, when and indeed because one's mind is on other matters. The ensuing events beca occur because of not little a, since not, uh, and since not little a involves no activity, the omissions, not big A through not big F, that comprise both not little a and where pertinent some ensuing event, are purely passive. Unlike the omissions depicted in figure three, it would be a mistake to describe them as acts of omission. The question arises, are any of the events depicted in figure four in my control? Since all control is rooted in direct control, the question here is whether not little a is in my control. Now, of course, one way in which I can see to it that not little a occurs is by seeing to it that a, little a star occurs, but this is precisely not what is at issue at this point. The question is whether a purely passive omission can be in an agent's control. From this point on, this is how I intend not little a to be understood, as my not deciding to raise my hand, but not in virtue of my deciding not to raise it. I am unsure. Uh, this is a bit of an anticlimax. I'm unsure of the answer to this crucial question. Earlier, when I discussed the question of what direct control over little a might consist in, I mentioned the possibility that it be understood in terms of the following pair of conditionals. 
If I were to desire, to desire to raise my hand more strongly than I desired not to raise it, I would decide to raise it, and if I were to desire otherwise, I wouldn't. It's not clear to me how the corresponding formula for not little a should be phrased. Regarding the first conditional alone, there are two possibilities. First, if I were to desire not to raise my hand more strongly than I desired to raise it, I would not decide to raise it. Second, if I were not to desire to raise my hand more strongly than I desired not to raise it, I would not decide to raise it. I also mentioned the possibility that my control over little a be understood in terms of having a reason rather than a desire to raise my hand. When applied to not little a, this idea yields still further conditionals for our consideration. Might my control over not little a be understood in terms of any of these conditionals? I will leave the question open, in part because of time constraints, but mostly because even if the truth of some such conditional proved to be necessary for my having control over not little a, the question would remain whether it was also sufficient for such control. This matches the situation earlier regarding little a. I raise the possibility that my direct control over my decision to raise my hand might be understood in terms of some such conditionals, but I certainly didn't insist on this. Nonetheless, it seems clear to me that we often are in direct control of our decisions, however such control is to be understood. Moreover, since I have no positive proposal to make regarding how direct control over events such as little a is to be understood, I am in no position to rule out the possibility that we also have direct control over events such as not little a. Here, though, the following objection might be made. One cannot have control that one cannot exercise. If I have control over little a, then trivially, I, al I can also exercise that control, and I will exercise it if I decide to raise my hand. Likewise, if I have control over little a star, then trivially, I can also exercise that control, and I will exercise it if I decide not to raise my hand. But the exercise of control, the exercise of control requires agency. Hence, not little a being a purely passive omission is not the sort of event over which I can exercise any control, and so it's not the sort of event over which I can have control. Although I have some sympathy with this objection, I'm afraid that it may simply beg the question at issue. The crucial premise is that there's a claim that the exercise of control requires agency. Why accept this claim? Earlier, I said that to exercise an ability to do something consists simply in doing that thing which one has the ability to do. The corresponding claim in the case of omissions is this, to exercise an ability not to do something consists simply in not doing that which one has the ability not to do. This claim does not presuppose that the exercise of an ability involves agency. Moreover, when we consider machines of the sort I mentioned earlier, such as a thermostat or an autopilot, it's clear that the exercise of control doesn't involve agency. True, it sounds a little odd to say that the thermostat exercises control over the temperature in a room rather than simply that it controls the temperature, but that may be because we are accustomed to thinking of the exercise of control in intentional terms. It's also true that we might not normally draw a distinction between the thermostats controlling the temperature and its being in control of the temperature. These terminological points notwithstanding, the fact remains that there is clearly a distinction between, on the one hand, the truth of a pair of subjunctive conditionals, such as in the case of the thermostat, if the temperature were to transcend certain limits, the thermostat would restore it to a preset range, and if the temperature were to stay within these limits, the thermostat would remain inactive and, on the other hand, the truth of the consequence of one of these conditionals. And I've suggested it is partly in terms of just such a distinction that the distinction between the possession and the exercise of agential control is at least sometimes to be understood. Furthermore, we would normally not shrink from saying that the thermostat is not only in control of, but is indeed controlling the temperature, even when the temperature remains within the specified limits and the thermostat therefore remains in passive mode. And if this is true of the thermostat, then perhaps the analogous claim is true of me. I am not only in control of the events depicted in figure four, but I am indeed exercising this control when these events occur. In summary, it seems clear that we can both exercise and possess, excuse me, both possess and exercise control over intentional omissions and also over some intentional, unintentional ones. The case depicted in figure three shows that. Whether we can possess and exercise control over the kind of events depicted in figure four is a question that I leave open. In that respect and to that extent, our omission control system remains a mystery, at least to me. 
Section three, briefly, ethical implications. <clears throat> The theme of this conference is the ethics and law of omissions, and so I had better say something, even if only very briefly, about that topic. I will therefore end with a few observations about the ethical significance of my findings. Many philosophers take control to be a prerequisite of either or both of moral obligation and moral responsibility. Some go on to claim that control is therefore a prerequisite of legal obligation and legal responsibility, at least in a morally well-founded society. Let me address these issues in turn. Suppose that I have a moral obligation to raise my hand because, say, I have promised to make some signal that requires my raising my hand. Then, if control of the sort that I have been discussing is a prerequisite of moral obligation, it follows that I have both the specific ability to raise my hand and the specific ability not to. This may well be a condition that I satisfy. Perhaps I can decide to raise my hand, and if I were so to decide, I would raise it. And I can also decide not to raise my hand, and if I were so to decide, I would not raise it. But now suppose that I have forgotten about my promise. My mind has wandered, and as a result, I don't raise my hand. As I noted earlier, many omissions occur when, in, when and indeed because one's mind strays to other matters. In such a case, my not raising my hand occurs not because I decide not to raise it, but simply because I don't decide to raise it, a purely passive omission. If my not deciding is in my control, then there's no reason to deny, as far as such control is concerned, that I thereby violate my obligation to raise my hand. But if my not deciding is not in my control, and if control is a prerequisite of moral obligation, then in failing to raise my hand, I will not have violated any such obligation. So too for moral responsibility. If control of the sort I've been discussing is a prerequisite of such resp responsibility, then if my not de deciding to raise my hand is not in my control, then I will not be morally responsible for not raising it. Whereas if my not deciding is in my control, then there is no reason to deny, it, as far as such control is concerned, that I am morally responsible for my behavior. Of course, it's Debatable whether control of the sort I've been discussing is a prerequisite of either moral obligation or moral responsibility. Some philosophers deny that it is. Some claim, for example, that ought does not imply can, and that as a result one can have moral obligations that one cannot fulfill. If so, then it may be that I will have violated a moral obligation to raise my hand, even if my not deciding to raise it was not in my control. Or again, some philosophers claim that control of the sort I've been considering, regulative control, is not necessary for being morally responsible for one's behavior. Either no control is necessary or it is only guidance control that's necessary. If so, then it may be that I will be morally responsible for not raising my hand even if I lacked regulative control over my not deciding to raise it. I would add, however, that even if regulative control isn't necessary for moral responsibility but guidance control is, the question whether I have guidance control over my not deciding to raise my hand would seem to me to be no easier to answer than the question whether I have regulative control over it. Suppose that control of the sort that I've been considering is a prerequisite of both moral obligation and moral responsibility. Even if this is the case, many omissions will satisfy that prerequisite. As figure three indicates, all intentional omissions will, and so will some unintentional ones. But perhaps some unintentional ones, those that are purely passive, won't. Whether they will or won't depends on whether we can exercise direct control over the pertinent non-decision. I have not been able to arrive at a definitive answer to this important question, an unwelcome omission for which I hope I may be forgiven. Thank you. Thank you.